All right, let's get started. Um, welcome everybody to today's special year seminar. Uh, we are pleased to have Shay Moran give a talk today. Shay is a visiting researcher at Google Brain and will also be joining the Department of Mathematics at the Technion in the fall. He has done lots of interesting work on learning theory, combinatorics, and communication complexity. Today, he will tell us about his work on boosting simple learners. Please welcome Shay Moore. So uh, thanks very much, uh, Kay, and, for, and also I want to thank the organizers for um, inviting me. When this talk was scheduled two months ago, I was hoping that uh, maybe by now I would be able to give it uh, in the normal way, but uh, I was probably too optimistic, And um, but, you know, maybe it seems that it's becoming a necessary skill to, to give Zoom talks, so... I apologize in advance because this is my first one, so I apologize for my performance. Um, yeah, so this is a joint work with uh, Noga, who is also here, with Elon Gonen, and with Elad Khazan, who may also come. Um, and yes, in this work, we basically, on a very high level, we've, we revisit the theory of boosting under the assumption that um, the weak hypothesis come from a simple class. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's start. So I will first begin with some background on boosting, which I guess most of you uh, are aware of. Um, and then I will uh, describe uh, formally our assumption and I'll present the main results. Okay, so... Um, so we focus on binary classification. So this is a setting in machine learning where we assume a domain X. So X is typically a Euclidean space. And there is some unknown target concept, which we wish to learn. Uh, concept is just a function, a binary function, and there is an unknown distribution on X. And what we get to see are a um, sample of C-labeled examples, so we get a, a sample of examples drawn from the distribution and labeled by this target concept. And our goal is to, to learn it, namely to find uh, an hypothesis or another function H, such that uh, the disagreement uh, region between the output function and the target concept has a small measure with respect to the unknown distribution. Uh, now, boosting is an approach for solving such problems, and in this approach, it is assumed that we have uh, an oracle access uh, to a, a weak learning algorithm, we denote it by W, and this weak learning algorithm is able to perform slightly better than chance, right? So if you just flip a coin for each uh, label, then with probability one half, you will get it right. And uh, the loss of uh, W is slightly better than one half and gamma is denoted uh, how much better. And given an Oracle access to such an algorithm, our goal is to produce uh, a learning rule, an hypothesis with arbitrarily small loss. And the boosting approach proceeds roughly as follows. So we get this sequence of examples. And what we do, we just repeat T times the following process we take a subsample of the input sample, we apply the weak learner on this subsample and we obtain a weak hypothesis, uh, which we denote by BT. We repeat it T times, and then we somehow aggregate the, the weak hypothesis into our final predictor. Typically the aggregation is done by taking the majority votes, for instance. And um, the intuition in boosting is that um, we focus on hard examples. So the way we pick the next subsample to train the weak learner on is according to those examples that were misclassified in the previous rounds. So that's the intuition. And in, in the end, the goal is that the, the sequence of all weak learners we obtain will somehow correct each other, such that uh, in total, they will be much better than, uh, than each of them individually. Okay. Now, when is boosting useful in practice? So boosting is useful when it's relatively easy to find rules of thumb that are often correct. 
So one example is uh, spam detection. So we want to detect whether a given email is spam. And here you can imagine that the pretty spam trigger phrases. So if the email contain the, word, the, the, the phrase apply now, or this is in junk or Nigerian prints, then it is very likely to be an email, uh, a junk email. Um, so, um, yeah, so boosting will basically be able to aggregate many of these very simple and maybe some somewhat local rules into a uh, aggregated strong hypothesis, which is much more accurate than each of them individual. Example for the usefulness of boosting, which I took from Wikipedia, is uh, the Viola Jones uh, framework. Here the goal is to to detect an input email and one uh, one algorithm that uh, does it um, is the Viola Jones algorithm, which uses boosting. And the weak hypothesis here are uh, these kind of rectangular uh, areas. So you some pixel rectangular areas of the image. Okay, so these are just these are just two examples that demonstrate. Um, when maybe in practice boosting this approach is useful. Okay, now, now I want to, to focus on what the difference between this work and previous works on boosting. So the, the line of work, the, the boosting, the line of work of boosting began in the late 80s. Uh, I think it was a seminar that Michael Kearns participated in and he asked as an open question whether boosting um, is possible computationally. So what, what did he mean? So we assume here that there is a target hypothesis class. So we know that the target concept is taken from some fixed uh, uh, known class. And what we are given is a weak learner for this target class. Namely, for every input distribution, D, and for every concept in the class, uh, if we feed the weak learner with examples labeled by this concept, then it will output an hypothesis which does non-trivially with respect to this particular distribution. And his question was whether this implies that you can efficiently uh, learn um, uh, concepts from A's to arbitrary precision. So not only one, min not only close to one half, but arbitrarily small. So that was, more, I think, most of theoretical work in boosting, on boosting was in this setting. What we do in our paper is a slightly a different setting. So we assume, so we, we call it base class oriented boosting rather than target class. So we assume now that we are given a base class of weak hypothesis. And we think of this base class as a very simple class, one that uh, uh, we could easily optimize on, so we could find global uh, mi minimizers, etc. And uh, yeah, so you can think of examples like decision stamp in our classifiers. Later, we will discuss it in more detail, but but for now, it is a base class and it is a simple class. And the weak learner is in fact a strong agnostic learner for this base class. And this this point is very important for the remaining of the talk. So pay attention. So the weak learner actually can, can find the best approximation in the class to any target concept, right? So for every distribution and for every concept, including concepts that are not in the base class, our weak learner will find the best approximation up to maybe small uh, additive error uh, to this target concept in the class. So the weakness, the weakness of the learner comes from the simplicity of the base class. The base class is restricted, and this, this is how the weakness of uh, the learner is manifested. Okay? And if you think about the previous examples with the rectangular, with the Viola Jones uh, phase detection, so it, it, it follows uh, a similar, uh, um, um, setting. Okay, and, and the goal, so what is the goal? It's very easy to learn target concepts from the base class. So the goal would be to learn concepts which are 
as far as possible from B. So we want to learn many, many concepts. We want to use the base concepts, the base, uh, uh, the base class uh, concepts from B to approximate arbitrary concepts to arbitrary precision. Okay, so again, previous work, we wanted to boost a weak learner for a given class to a strong learner for the same class. Here we're given a strong learner for a simple base class and you want to boost it to a strong learner for, strong learner for a larger class. Okay, so what, what will be our questions, our main questions? So the first question that comes to mind is whether anything non-trivial can be even done with, uh, in, this, in this setting. So we are given a very simple class, base class. Can we even learn any concepts that are interesting, that are significantly far away from B? And we will see that the answer is yes, under very mild assumption on B, which we will uh, state formally soon. We can learn other concepts. Uh, of course, this gamma will go to zero to in order to do that. And the second question we will ask is, does this assumption affect the previous results in, 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 in the theory of boosting? Indeed, it does, and it, it allows to circumvent a, a classic, uh, a classic lower bound by Point and Shapiro on the Oracle complexity. Okay, so these are the two main questions. How do previous results change under this assumption that the weak learner is restricted? And what can be even done? Uh, what can be learned in this, uh, in this context? Okay, so we'll actually begin with question number two. And in the end, uh, we will, I will tell you a little bit about our answer to question number one. Okay. So, so first of all, let me formally state what our working assumption is. How do we quantify that the weak, that the base class is simple? So the way we do it is that we assume that the base class is a VC class. What does it mean to be a VC class? It means that the VC dimension of this class is small. We will even make the assumption that it's constant, but it can be more than constant, but it has to be small. Okay, so again, the base class is a VC class. And this is inspired by the convention which I took from Shapiro's and Freund's book that uh, weak hypothesis are rules of thumb from an easy to learn class. And indeed, we know that, uh, that the VC dimension characterizes the sample complexity of, um, of, of learning uh, uh, um, concept classes, especially we, if, we, if we consider empirical risk minimization. So again, we remember that in our assumption, we assume that we have a small class where we can optimize globally, we can find the best, uh, can, we can apply ERM, and ERM is exactly captured by the VC dimension. So that's how we, we formalize the simplicity. And some examples, so, uh, one toy example, which is uh, which was very useful, at least for us, to understand uh, what we want to prove, is one-dimensional thresholds. So these are just uh, all uh, thresholds function uh, on the on the line, and there are two uh, natural extensions of this class in terms of in, in the context of boosting. Uh, here, the this dimension is one. So one extension is d-dimension decision stamps. So these are uh, exits aligned uh, half spaces. So each, uh, each function here is the sign function of a linear function, which is uh, uh, aligned with the, one of the axes. And this has this dimension uh, log D roughly. And the other extension is uh, arbitrary D-dimensional linear classifiers. So here, uh, not only uh, exist aligned half spaces, but arbitrary half spaces. Um, and here, the this dimension is either D, it's the minimum between D, or if we are in a setting where we assume margin, so it's at most uh, one over margin squared. Okay, so here are just some examples. And uh, the Sidon stamp is one very popular class in the context of boosting as a, as a 
the class of quick learners. Okay, so let us uh, now discuss the first uh, main result about oracle complexity. Okay, so here we show that under this assumption, we can circumvent a, a classic lower bound. So, uh, Fond and Shapire proved in, I think, the first result was in 95, and then in 2012, when they wrote the book, they uh, expanded it a little bit. Um, basically, what they showed is that any boosting algorithm you will propose, for any boosting algorithm G, and for any gamma greater than zero, one can cook a particularly bad weak learner W and the target, target class H, such that W is a gamma weak learner for H, as, as, as assumed in the context of boosting. But in order to achieve non-trivial loss, let's say less than one, uh, 110, the, bo the boosting algorithm must call W at least one over gamma squared times. Okay, so, so for any boosting algorithm you can come up with, you can come up with a bed such that the oracle complexity is at least quadratic in the advantage parameter. And, um, and other boost, of course, achieves the matching uh, upper bound. So this shows that other boost is in some sense optimal. But a caveat in, in the proof is that uh, it is derived using the probabilistic method. This is a good thing, but uh, what it implies is that um, the class of hypothesis, of weak hypothesis used by the weak learner depends on gamma. So it's not a fixed class. It's, for every gamma you will specify, there will be a different class. And more, moreover, the VC dimension of this class will in fact go to infinity as gamma goes to zero. So the weak learner that uh, witnesses the large, sample, the large oracle complexity uses rather complicated hypothesis as weak hypothesis. And this is exactly what we don't allow in our setting. Okay? So it is natural to ask whether the same lower bound holds even when you restrict the, the weak learner to output hypothesis from a VC class. And as we will see, and as I will explain now, the answer is no. You can take it down to roughly one over gamma. So it's a quadratic improvement. And this is also tight, even for the class of uh, one-dimensional thresholds. So this is the best you can hope for. So let me now uh, discuss at least some ideas in how to, to, to circumvent this lower bound, how to obtain this linear dependence. Okay, so the main idea is to allow for complex aggregations. What do I mean by that? So most, or maybe almost all, previous boosting algorithms, they use, the, the, the way they aggregate the weak hypothesis is by a majority vote. So they just, for every uh, instance, to, to determine the the label of this instance, they just ask all the weak learners, they, all the weak hypotheses they obtained, and they choose the most popular vote, most popular label. Okay, so it's just a sign of a linear combination. Um, and we will see that uh, in order to circumvent the lower bound, we, we, we must use most, more complex aggregation rules. So what is an aggregation rule? What do I mean by that? So an, an, an aggregation rule is simply a function, a Boolean function, which takes the outputs of each of the weak learners, each of the weak hypotheses, and outputs a bit, the, our output, the output of the, the final predictor. Okay, so the final prediction, so we, 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 we train the weak learners, we obtain them B1 up to BT. T is the number of times we called the weak learning algorithm. 
And then every X, the label of X is given by this aggregation rule applied on this uh, uh, vector B of X. If you think about it, B of X can be seen as a representation of the instance X according to the BIs. So as we apply the boosting algorithm, we always, we get a weak hypothesis, which is kind of a new feature. It is a new feature in this vector. And um, so th that's, a, I think, a, a, a good way to, to think about the, the weak hypothesis. They simply give you a representation. Every X goes to this sequence of, uh, of bits. Okay. Now there could be other aggregation rules. So one, one thing which we are already seeing is the weighted majorities, but you can also take polynomial threshold functions. So you take the, you take the, the first hypothesis, apply it on X, you square it, you, and then you add it to other um, powers of uh, different hypotheses. Or you could also take uh, decision trees. So, uh, the, the nodes are the weak hypothesis, and you simply um, apply the tree on, a, on any given x and until you reach a leaf, and the leaf tells you what the, the output is. Or you can take a deep learning, uh, deep neural networks if you want. Or, so there are many, many ways to aggregate uh, the weak hypothesis and a sequence of weak hypotheses. So the strategy, so remember that we want to, to come up with a boosting algorithm that does much less than one over gamma squared calls to the weak learner. The strategy will be to just obtain an interpolating aggregation rule. So recall that our input sample is, is, is uh, just a sequence of examples, x i c of x i. And we produce in the algorithm this representation uh, B. So the strategy is just to apply the weak learner enough times to produce B1 up to BT until there exists an interpolating aggregation rule. Namely, we can somehow uh, aggregate the weak learners so that on every input example, we get the right label. So we can interpolate the input sample. Okay, so in other words, we obtain a small representation, the smallest we can, we can obtain by, by producing these weak learners, which allows to interpolate the input sample. Okay, so this will be our strategy. Okay, and then, uh, and the next slide is the main observation for how to do it. Um, so the, the key observation is that, so you can ask yourself when, given, given a list of weak, of weak hypotheses, when can one separate all, uh, when can one interpolate? So the observation is that the, the existence of an interpolating aggregation rule is equivalent that for every pairs, every pair of input examples that have opposite labels, for every xi and xj such that cfxi is different from cfj, we want that the representation will also be different. Right, so this is clearly a necessary condition. If we have xi and xj, one of them is labeled one and the other one is labeled zero, and they have the same representation vector, so we must make a mistake, no matter how, what, what, how we set, whether we send this vector to zero or to one. And it can also, one can also convince themselves that it's, it's clearly enough, because once uh, every, every pair of such examples have different vectors, you can just define a function on the representation space, which is interpolating. Okay, and then, uh, but, yeah, so, so let us just say that if the representation of xi and xj is different, then we say that they are separated by the weak hypothesis. 
the nice thing is that um, it is uh, so. So the, the strategy now becomes much much clearer, as we will see, because now we don't worry anymore about some interpolating rule, interpolating regression rule. We just worry about separating all opposite labeled pairs. And as you would see, this is a rather a, a, it's rather easy to achieve that fast. So what is the what is the boosting algorithm? How do we do it? So yes, yeah, so remember that we have, this is the input sample and we have an Oracle access to our weak learner. So what we do, we just repeat until all opposite labeled pairs are separated. So until uh, this condition is satisfied. And what we do is that similar to other boosting algorithms, we define the distribution DT on the examples such that dt of xi is proportional to the degree of xi. Now, what is the degree of xi? And this is the crucial definition here. The degree of xi is the number of j's, so it's the number of other examples j that have different labels, so we want to separate them from xi, but they are not yet separated by the hypothesis produced thus far. Another way to think of it is to define a graph gt, on the examples where you connect a pair of examples if they have opposite labels and they have no, were not separated yet. So if you define this graph, the, the distribution assigned to each example is just proportional to, to the degree in this. Okay? So it's very similar to other boost in the sense that uh, we always reweight the input samples, but here the weighting scheme is different. Okay. So, and the analysis is also is, is, is pretty is pretty simple. I'm sure that uh, maybe it takes five minutes to digest the definitions, but it's it's, it's an exercise. So the, the the main lemma here is that in each round. A gamma fraction of remaining pairs are separated on expectation. So because W is a weak learner and because the way we define the distribution, in each round we will get that gamma fraction of the remaining pairs are separated. Now in the beginning we have M choose two or M squared, at most M squared pairs that are not separated. In each round, the number of pairs that survive is at most one minus gamma times in the previous round. So in total, the total number of rounds will be log M over gamma, where M is the size of the input sample. So that's how we get the Oracle complexity upper bound, which is uh, only linear in gamma and not quadratic. Okay, but there is a caveat to this algorithm which I want to discuss. So notice that what we did is we just applied the weak learner long enough until we can interpolate. But you know the existence of this interpolating rule is promised because all opposite labeled pairs are separated, but we have no idea how it looks like. It may be very, very complicated, right? So before we said that there are many, many ways to interpolate, decision trees, polynomials, etc. Right, in fact, there are two to the two to the t such possibilities, right? Any function from two to the t to two is an interpolating rule. And if this function is very complicated, then, then um, this could be a problem. In particular, uh, the complexity of, of this function is closely related to the generalization bounds we can prove. Okay, so this brings us to generalization. So how can we prove that indeed this aggregated hypothesis, hypothesis learns, achieves uh, a small loss, small population loss? So observe that we must use somehow the fact that the weak hypothesis are restricted because otherwise the lower bound by Fond and Shapira applies, right? Notice that this algorithm is completely oblivious to the class. 
the way we reweight. So this algorithm cannot learn um, complicated base classes. So we must somehow use here that the weak hypotheses are restricted. Okay, so let me very, very roughly tell you how, how to use it. So what we do is uh, represent the output hypothesis as a decision tree and a very simple decision tree. So the node is the first uh, weak hypothesis, the second, uh, the two immediate children of the node are the um, second weak hypothesis and, and so forth. So we get a, a tree of depth T, the number of weak hypotheses we, we obtained in the algorithm. And the key uh, observation here, or the key lemma here is that um, the number of richer beliefs in this tree is much, much less than two to the T, right? If you have a binary tree of depth T, number of tips can be two to the T at most. But because of our assumption that the weak hypothesis come from a VC plus, the number of leaves, the number of richer beliefs, so we can prune this tree in a way that we get an equivalent tree, and the total number of leaves will only be polynomial in T rather than exponential in T. And this is the key. So apart from that, it's just a standard uh, sample conversion or Occam razor argument. And uh, eventually we get that the loss is, um, is uh, polynomial in uh, uh, log M and one over gamma over M. So notice that we used, we did exploit our assumption that weak hypothesis are seen. Okay. And, and then one other remark I want to say in this context is that um, we actually get the generalization bounds we obtain are, are algorithm dependent. So if somehow you manage to, uh, to find an aggregation rule using some heuristic and you do it in a smart way that, uh, that eventually you use, uh, uh, you know, uh, aggregation rules from a restricted class, then you can get better generalization bounds. In particular, we prove the following theorem that if the aggregation rule G belongs to a restricted class, to a simple class, so either this dimension or you can also replace it by the number of bits you need to encode it, it's the same. So if the aggregation rule be belongs to a class of this dimension D sub G, then the loss will be bounded by these two terms and the first term VC of B over gamma cube M is a standard term that you see in all, in, in all boosting algorithms. Actually, in other boosting it is slightly worse. You get gamma to the four because of the one over gamma squared. And then there is this other term, DG over M, which is an aggregation dependent excess. So the smaller DG is, the, the better this term is, the smaller this term is, and, and the overall loss is better. Okay. So, so we, we, we show this boosting algorithm, this interpolating boosting algorithm, which, which breaks, which circumvents the store bound. But a natural question is whether you can, maybe under this assumption that B is restricted, also the standard boosting algorithms that, you, that aggregate by majority, they also, only need one over gamma squared, uh, one over gamma oracle calls. So in particular, maybe if other boost, if you assume that the base class is restricted, is a VC class, maybe you can somehow analyze other boost in a better way and show that already other boost achieves only one over gamma calls to the weak learner. So unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, and uh, we proved that if you, even if you take a rather natural base class, d-dimensional classifier, d-dimensional uh, half spaces for small d, then every boosting algorithm which aggregates um, by weighted majorities 
as oracle complexity, which is almost quadratic in gamma. Okay, so there is a small, it's, it's one over gamma to the two minus alpha, where alpha is two over d plus one. So it's almost quadratic in gamma. Maybe you can do a little bit better, but, uh, but certainly you cannot get uh, linear in one over gamma. Um, so in this sense, among the family, in the family of weighted majority uh, aggregation boosting algorithms, other boost is nearly optimal. And the proof of this result is, uh, is it's, yeah, so it uses the notion of gamma VC dimension, which we will discuss in the next part uh, when, we, when we talk about expressivity. Um, yeah, so I will not talk about the proof now. Okay, so let's, uh, let's summarize uh, the first uh, main result we discussed and then we'll move to the expressivity. So what we showed is that if the base class is restricted, then the order complexity of boosting improves from one over gamma squared to one over gamma. We, dis we, we said that this improvement requires relatively complex aggregation rules. And the, okay, I didn't talk about the quantitative bound so much, but the generalization bound we give is polynomial, but it is rather pessimistic. So the, 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 the degrees of the polynomials are, uh, are uh, depend, de depend on the VC dimension in a pessimistic way. But uh, plausibly, you can get better bounds for specific classes, decision stamps, half spaces. And here, maybe you can use the, the algorithm dependent generalization bounds that we, we proved. Okay. So this, this is the, we're done with the, with the first part. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer. Shai, yeah. can I ask a question? <clears throat> can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah, so <clears throat> with regards to the generalization bound, naively, if I think about the class that you're dealing with, you are interacting with the data in a complicated way to build up these features. And then you're considering uh, this uh, decision tree acting on the, the features. You show the decision tree is going to be small, but it seems like a priori the number of uh, feature maps you might deal with is in some sense large because it's data dependent. Maybe that's why you end up getting this uh, VC of B and then exponent. But I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, is that, is that intuition right or wrong? No, so, so I, think, I think if I understand you correctly, then I think uh, the intuition is right. So um, in particular, our generalization bounds don't use everything that is given. So in a sense, we show that, um, so, so you know, that the assumption is that somehow the, the input sample is strongly correlated with the class. And we don't, right, so for every distribution over the sample, there is a weak hypothesis that is, that is correlated with it. And we don't use it. We only, our generalization bound is much, much weaker. It, it only uses the fact that it is expressible by the algebra generated in the, in, with the class. So, so I certainly, uh, I believe, and I also hope that our generalization bound is pessimistic and maybe, maybe your intuition of, on how to improve it is, uh, is right. Okay. I have a naive question perhaps. Um, so what do you mean by the aggregation rule being in the VC class? Like how do you choose the aggregation rule? Like is it depend on the data? Yeah, okay. So, so it, it take other boost for instance or any boosting algorithm. So what is a majority vote? A majority vote is simply a half space, right? Right. So then the, 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 it's, a, it's a VC class, right? If you have T, T typically you have log M, T is like log M. So the so in other boost uh, it's um the, the the aggregation rule comes from a VC class. I don't know if you use maybe neural nets with some bounded uh, 
you know, you train, you, you, you try to interpolate the data using the neural net of some bounded um, uh, size. It will also be, you can also bound the VC of this class. So the so the so, so the, the notion of this dimension is not so important. The, the, you can also think about bit complexity. If you are somehow able in some particular context to find an aggregation rule which is relatively simple, maybe it's not a half space, maybe it's not a majority vote, but it's a majority of majorities or something which is still rather simple, then you can uh, get better generalization bounds. Okay. Um... Now, maybe a follow-up question. Um, so, I mean, the majority rule itself, um, I'm having a hard time picturing this, but the majority rule, is that a particular half space or is it the, the class, the space of all half spaces? That's a good question. So uh, you can, so there are boosting algorithms such as other boost where it is, where you need to really consider the class of half spaces because the weight will depend on the, 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 the it's a weighted majority and the weights will be data dependent. But there are other boosting algorithms such as the um, uh, boost by majority, where I think you just simply, simply take uh, the naive majority and then it's just a fixed aggregation rule. Okay. But, and the statement you made about, um, you know, so are, are we considering a class of ADA boost algorithms for all the possible uh, weighting schemes um, and that that statement is true, or like, are we considered a particular ADA boost with a particular weighting scheme? Uh, no, a particular ADA boost. Take the standard ADA boost, like uh, you know, fix the meta parameter. Still, the, the the if if you like the standard way to analyze the generalization bounds for ADA boost, even for a particular ADA boost, like uh, because the weights are algorithm dependent, they 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 are random variables. The weights they are not fixed in advance then one considers the class of all half spaces, even in the classical uh, um, anal analysis of other boosts in order to bound, uh, to, to obtain a generalization bound. Okay, cool, thank you. Okay, okay, great. So let's, uh, let's now um, go back to, go to the first question we asked. So let me remind you, so this question is in a sense even more basic. So, so what can be even learned under this restriction. So remember that we assume a base class of bounded VC dimension and that our weak learner is an ERM, it's an agnostic learner for B. So it will always find the best approximation in this simple class. So clearly we can use this weak learner to learn any concept from B, right? We just apply it one time. But can we do much more than that? Can we learn concepts that are far away from B? Um, Right, if the answer is no, then this whole uh, setting is maybe not so interesting. So let's revisit the weak learning assumption in our context. So I claim that the weak learning assumption amounts to the following definition. So when, when is a sample legal? When can we apply other boost or any boosting algorithms on a given sample? So a sample S is called gamma realizable. That's, that's the, the name by the class. If for every weight, for every distribution on the examples, there will be some hypothesis in the class, some weak hypothesis that is correlated. The, the, the loss is at most one, of, one minus gamma over two. If you think about it, this is exactly the weak learning assumption or the empirical weak learning assumption uh, when we assume an oracle to an, an ERM for, from B. So, right, so the gamma realizable samples is the, are exactly the legal inputs for boosting with advantage gamma. Right, so for every, what does it mean? It means that for every distribution, every way we reweight the input sample, there will be an appropriate weak hypothesis in, this, in the class which achieves the desired correlation, the desired loss, one minus gamma over two. Okay, now notice that when gamma equals one, this specializes to the standard definition of realizability. So there exists an hypothesis in the class which interpolates the sample, which agrees with it everywhere. Okay, and uh, the first uh, result in this context is that 
Yeah, so almost every base class, soon we'll see what is almost every, can express arbitrarily complex concepts, okay? So let us assume that, so what is almost every? So let us assume that B, that the base class B satisfies the following conditions. First of all, it is symmetric. It is closed under complementation. If for every B, if B is in the class, then also minus B. The negation of B is also in the class. The second condition, maybe it's a little bit less uh, um, natural from first sight, is that it, it has full rank. What do I mean by that? It means that for any finite sequence of points, any finite set of points, x1 up to xn, if you look at the, at the vectors, you know, you, you project your class from x1 to xn, you look at all possible real vectors, real n-dimensional vectors that are obtained by, uh, by projecting the class, then you get, you get a spanning set, you get rank n. So if you put them in a matrix, you get a rank n matrix. So the rank is full. Okay, notice that this is satisfied by almost any class which is considered in the literature, including singletons or uh, thresholds, or uh, so this is really, um, uh, I mean, it's not much to ask. Even the, the one dimensional class is uh, satisfied. So if these two assumptions hold, then for every sample S, there is some gamma greater than zero, such that S is gamma realizable. Now, what does it mean? Okay, yeah, so what does this mean? This means that, um, that if we run other boosts or any other boosting algorithm for enough iterations, we will be able to interpolate any input sample S, right? Every sample S is legal for other boost if you tune gamma to be small enough. And I will not get much into it, but this can be used to, to, to derive universal consistency. So it can, it can be used to show that if you take uh, other boost or other boosting algorithms, then you can use these algorithms to learn uh, any target concept, but of course the sample complexity will be target concept dependent. It will depend on the target concept, just like we have in uh, k-nearest neighbors, for instance, right? It's a base consistent algorithm. It's, uh, um, okay, so this really says that you can use boosting to approximate arbitrary um, as long as the base class satisfies these conditions. Uh, okay, but this is really a qualitative statement, right? It tells you that in the limit as gamma goes to zero, you can approximate arbitrary concepts. Okay, but we would like to quantify this phenomena um, and to give some, you know, effective bounds maybe. Okay, so, so the question here is what, so for fixed gamma, we fix some small gamma greater than zero. How large is this class of concept that can be learned using any boosting algorithm, but let's just think about other boosts um, um, with uh, advantage gamma. And at what rate does this class grow as gamma goes to zero, right? So as gamma goes to zero, if we can learn more and more concepts, you would like to, 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 to understand it. So we use the following measure to quantify. So the gamma VC dimension of B is the largest D such that you can find D points X1 to XD such that no matter how you pick labels to this point, you have two to the D ways to do it. And no matter how you pick the YIs, the overall sample will be gamma realizable. Right, so it means that using, um, so that so for every sample, every pattern on these six eyes is, is, is gamma realizable by the class. So, and one, uh, I think, good way to think about it is, it's the VC dimension of the class of all concepts that can be learned by boosting with advantage gamma. Okay or uh, all concepts that are gamma correlated to B, with the class. 
Okay, so um, yeah, so this the definition we said it. So here are some basic observations. So if gamma equals one, you just get the Vc dimension of the class. And of course, when gamma decreases to zero, it increases because you 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 can approximate more things, you, you correlate with more things. And as we said before, uh, as gamma goes to zero, the 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 the, the Vc dimension goes to infinity under these mild conditions that are satisfied by by you know with the basic classes. Okay. So right, so so this is this is the quantity we we use to measure how expressive a base class is in in boosting when it is used in boosting. So how how large is the class of concepts that can be learned with advantage gamma? Right, so so how to pick the base class? So on the one hand, we want we want it to be easy to learn. So this means that the VC dimension should be small, right? This means that every time we call the weak learner, it will not work too hard. And on the other hand, we want it to be very expressive. So we want the gamma VC dimension to be large. We want that as gamma goes to zero, we can approximate more and more concepts. And uh, so we would like to understand the trade-off between the VC dimension and the gamma VC dimension. Okay, so uh, the first bound in this context is that the gamma VC dimension is at most D over gamma squared. Okay, so you can never get better than this. So this is some kind of an impossibility result. The, the dimension of what you can learn with advantage gamma is at most quadratic in gamma. And this is tight when gamma is not very small, when gamma is at least two to the minus two D. And if gamma is small, then you can get better bounds um, which are similar to the bounds we've seen before in the context of uh, majority votes. So it's almost quadratic, but there is a epsilon. Um, now, yeah, the, the really the final slide will just uh, tell you about the gamma VC dimension of some well-studied classes. So consider the class of D-dimensional half spaces linear classifiers. So uh, the gamma VC dimension here is actually as large as it can be. So it is a very expressive class in terms of boosting. So the gamma VC dimension is roughly, I mean, the, the dependence on, on gamma is almost quadratic, two minus alpha of D. And um, let me just mention here that the dependence on D that we get is loose. So uh, that's why I wrote theta D, theta sub D. So, and it would be interesting to get, of course, better bound in terms of D. So the lower bound and the upper bound uh, are apart by exponential, uh, exponential um, um, patterns. Um, but let me also mention that the set which witness that that uh, the gamma VC dimension of half spaces is large are very natural. So the set where you can approximate any target concept, right? The the the, the, the samples where you can approximate every tar target concept are very natural. So these are regular grids, for instance, or in fact any set such that the ratio between the largest to the smallest distance is not too large. It's n to the one over d. So, so this means that basically if your distribution, if the target distribution is like a nice density, then you know the second condition will hold and indeed half spaces will be very expressive to be able to express um, uh, uh, any, any target concept. Okay, so this is for half spaces. Ah, no, no, let me tell you a little bit about the proof. Okay, so the proof is uh, is based on discrepancy theory. Now, unfortunately, I will not have time to tell you more about it. But um, for those of you who know what geometric discrepancy is, let me just note that the gamma VC dimension is, in a very precise sense, 
distribution-free variant of discrepancy. Okay, so, so right, if you remember the definition of gamma visit dimension or gamma realizability, we had a quantifier there for any distribution, right, and for any target concept, it should be real gamma realizable. And discrepancy is defined in a similar way, only that you fix the distribution to be the uniform distribution, not for any distribution. So, and so this relationship with discrepancy allows us to use uh, many ideas from there to study the gamma VC dimension. And in the ca case of half spaces, we really basically need to modify uh, uh, the, the analogous statement by Alexander to, to get this result. Um, the second class which I want to discuss the, the gamma visit dimension of is the is decision stamps. So these are axis aligned half spaces. Here the gamma visit dimension the visit dimension is just log D. So th this class is actually, I think, popular in the context of boosting. Uh, so here the gamma visit dimension is not as good, right? It's, it's not a it's only linear in one over gamma. Um, yeah, so it's less expressive than half spaces, but on the other hand, it's much easier to optimize over a decision stamp. So from a comp computational perspective, it's, it's better. Um, again, also here, dependence on these loops is very loose. And yeah, the upper boundary proof actually is a little bit more general than decision stamps. It holds for any family, which is the union of one dimensional classes. Right, so decision stamps, you can take the half spaces uh, for every axis, you can look at the half spaces aligned with this axis. So it's just a union of D families like that. Each of them is one dimensional. Um, so the lower bound is simple. It's just even, it's enough to show it for D equals one if we don't care about the dependence on D. The upper bound is more interesting. Uh, in particular here, we were not able to use uh, the corresponding tools from discrepancy theory, and we had to to adjust. And uh, the proof is based on a linear programming argument and the house levels packing lemma. Again, only for those of you who know what this means, uh, I will not get into technical details in this talk. Um, okay, so let let's summarize and then leave some time for questions. So we revisited boosting under the assumption that the base class B is restricted. The weak learner can only use simple hypothesis. Formally, we quantified it using the assumption that the DC dimension of the base classifier is small. Uh, the, the first main result we discussed was that this assumption allows to circumvent a lower bound on the Oracle complexity. And we, we, we saw this kind of intriguing uh, phenomena that it requires non-standard non -standard aggregation. Uh, not the usual majority vote, but something more complex, uh, more complicated circuits. Um, and the second, uh, the second uh, focus was to understand how expressive uh, base classes are when used in this context of boosting. So we show that in the limit, every or almost every base class can express arbitrary concepts. And uh, we also gave quantitative bounds on this expressivity using this notion of gamma VC dimension. And let me remind you that this notion of gamma VC dimension was also critical in the lower bound in, uh, for the first main result. So where we show that you must use um, something different than majorities, something more complicated. Uh, this also uses the notion of gamma vista dimension, and this is actually the technical, from a technical perspective, this is the bridge that connects these two main results. But uh, yeah, so, but I will not, unfortunately, I will not, uh, I will not discuss these uh, technical details uh, in this talk. Yeah, so um, I think I'm done. Uh, thank you very much.
All right, let's share, thank Shay for the great talk. Any questions for Shay? Yep. That's a uh, quick clarification. So, so the main result, the first main result was, was that because it was predicated on the assumption, which you then show is weak, that there is a weak learner relative to the base class for the distribution that you're trying to um, work with, right? Can, can you repeat it? I, I, was, I could not understand. Um, yeah, I guess I, I, I was just trying to. Right, so we assume that the, we, we assume that we assume the same setting like like uh, other boost, like the usual boosting setting. So we have a gamma realizable sample, but we just uh, further assume that every weak hypothesis we get is comes from a class of bounded VC dimension. Right, and then and then you're showing, uh, I guess, in the, in the second half, that that is not a strong assumption that. Yeah. So the second, in the second part, we studied like whether this uh, assumption really, whether it makes sense. Like uh, if if you can learn uh, concepts that are far away from the class, or maybe you know one could think that if you assume that the weak learner is simple, then you could, then you can only learn trivial things with it. Only maybe the class B or something very close to B. But then, so the second main result was was to show that uh, that yeah that in a sense you can learn arbitrarily complex uh, functions using very simple base classes. But let me also note that uh, in the practical applications of boosting, are I think are more of the sort of the of 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 what we do here. So you use you have these features like in the Viola Jones example or the email, uh, spam email detection, you really have uh, simple features. So the weak learner produces simple features and you use them to aggregate, you aggregate them to learn um, complex uh, uh, concepts, which, which are not uh, from the base class. So, so I think that you know the, this this convention that at least in practice it's uh, it's it's common that the weak learner weak learner uses simple rules. Uh, I, I didn't see it formalized in, in theory, and that's that's one of the reasons we 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 did this work. So that's very so, beautiful. Um, quick question in terms of the, the in terms of the use of VC several times. So. Um, is in, in, in improving the generalization, do you establish a class of functions uh, with a, a uniformly small generalization error? Or is it, or is the proof really just a direct argument for the uh, classifier that you've learned? Does that question make sense? Yes, so it's uniformly small depending on gamma. And, and, and the target classifier, the complexity will affect gamma. So once you fix gamma and you tell me this target concept is gamma correlated with the class, so the generalization bound we give will only depend on gamma and the VC dimension and the, you know, the other standard. Uh, and later, we, the target dependent um, um, is, is only manifested inside gamma. The dependency of the target concept. So once you fix gamma, we give uniform bounds, but then you can ask for, for a target concept, how small should gamma be? And then you can get uh, target dependent bounds. Hey, Shai, uh, I have a question, a beautiful talk. Um, I, uh, okay, so most of the talk focused on uh, the VC the, the aspect of having a small VC dimension uh, for for the the weak learner uh, the hypothesis class. Um, 
But there was, there was another assumption too about it being an agnostic learner for the base class. And I, I just wondered, have you have any thoughts on to what extent that's a necessary assumption or could you weaken it to just being a weak learner for the target function? But then if, you, if it's just a weak learner for the target function and you, and you don't want to, so, so diagnostic just tells you that you're able to find the best approximation in the restricted class to the target function under this distribution. But if we weaken, so if we assume that we, so do you mean to ask if, if our weak learning algorithm is just a realizable case algorithm for the, the base class? Can we do anything then? Yeah, so, so just the usual weak learning assumption is just that, um, you know, I can, it will always produce, whatever distribution I give it uh, on, let's say the marginal, I change up the marginal distribution, it will, it will give me back, you know, a, a one half minus gamma um, error rate. Uh, and that's, it seems, at least it, it's not obvious to me that that would be equivalent. It seems, seems like a weaker assumption uh, than saying it's an agnostic learner. No, no, okay. So I think, okay, let, let's go back to the definition of gamma realizability. Um, so, so again, we, the, 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 the weak learning assumption is on the class, okay? So we assume that the target concept satisfies the gamma weak learning assumption for the class, namely for any distribution on the sample there will be an hypothesis in the class, in the distributed class, which is uh, which achieves non-trivial loss. And okay, so that's the, that's the weak learning assumption. You can the, the the target concept is non-trivially correlated with the assumed class. Now, to be able to get this B that we have promised it, that it exists, we need an agnostic learner for the class. Is it necessary or can you, in other words, you could just have a, a, an algorithm that is able to produce this guarantee, um, right, whereas... Right, yes, you can have just an algorithm that produces this guarantee and, and uh, okay, uh, now I think I understand your question. So yeah, so it's enough to just, uh, to that it will satisfy the weak learning guarantee and the output hypothesis will be restricted to a VC class. And one natural way to get it is to take an ERM for the base for, for the for the simple class. But you're right, we don't need the we don't need the formally we don't need it. Oh okay, great. That's great. Okay. Any other questions? All right, if there are no more questions, that concludes today's seminar. Uh, let's thank Shay again for the great talk. Thank you very much.